This lesson will be covering the vectors section of the physics syllabus. So when we refer to vectors, we are referring to a measurable quantity. We, when we refer to measurable quantities, we divide this into scalar quantities and vector quantities. Simply a scalar quantity is a quantity that has magnitude, but no direction whereas a vector quantity is one which has magnitude and direction. So if you look at the list, um, scalar quantities would be distance, speed, mass, time, anything that does not require a direction. Distance, you would say four kilometers, but you would not include a distance. Same with speed, mass, you would say 45 kilograms, but you would not include a direction for that mass. Whereas if you look at vectors, a vector has magnitude and direction. So when you refer to displacement, you would say four kilometers north or four kilometers south. Velocity, you would say four meters per second north or four meters per second east. For weight, you would say 45 newtons down. Same for acceleration and same for force. So the fundamental difference is when asked about a scalar quantity, there's no direction whereas a vector there is direction and when you give a vector quantity in any of your answers you must always include the direction for that vector quantity otherwise the answer is incorrect and then just to go through a fundamental concept which a lot of people don't understand if you look at the the picture here between a and b an object travels between a and b the object can take a straight line distance or a straight line path shown here, or the object could take a more roundabout path as shown here. Your object between A and B will travel those two distances. However, this path where it's more roundabout and takes a longer path would be your distance. So when you calculate your distance, you would calculate the entire length of this path that the object takes. Whereas when you refer to displacement, you only calculate the amount of distance between A and B on a straight line basis. So it's the distance between your starting point being A and your ending point being B. You do not take into account any of the extra distance that was covered. Further, when you refer to your displacement, you would always give a direction. So in this, in this context, you would say, x distance or x kilometers east of a then we move on to velocity and speed so velocity is calculated with your displacement which is your straight line distance between a and b so it's your displacement in meters over your time in seconds and you must always specify your direction and give the answer a unit which is meters per second speed on the other hand is calculated with your distance, which is your roundabout, your total length of the path taken by the object. And this is also calculated um, using distance over time. And the unit is meters per second. However, you don't give a direction because it is a scalar quantity. Then we move on to average and instantaneous velocity. So an average velocity would be over a large interval where you have your total displacement in meters over your time and that's measured in meters per second and remember your direction whereas instantaneous velocity which shows the velocity of an object at a particular instant is calculated using displacement in meters over time however in this instance your time is a very small interval so that your instantaneous velocity is calculated for that interval and you must always remember if you calculate, say, displacement over time and your time period is six seconds, your velocity becomes instantaneous halfway in the time interval, which would be at three seconds. Then we move on to acceleration. Acceleration is calculated using your final velocity minus your initial velocity over the time period for which you are examining the object.
and it is measured in meters per second squared as shown here and you must always include the direction of your acceleration. Now, when you're specifically referring to vectors in your physics, you will always have a direction of a vector. The head of the vector refers to the direction of travel of the vector and tail is obviously the back end of the vector. Firstly, your direction can be measured using a vertical line depicting north and then you measure with a bearing from the north line. Alternatively, you can use cardinal points as shown here, um, say 45 degrees east of north or 20 degrees east of south. You may want to use that method to give you a direction of your vectors. It's up to you and in many examples, some will work, some will be easier. Um, it's honestly up to you in each example to decide how you would like to do that. Then we move on to addition of vectors. So this is when you get an example, say there's an object where a force is applied. One force is applied here and another force is applied. So say, yeah, A to B is a force, B to C is a force. And then you would look at your resultant force, which would be AC. So there are a number of methods to work out your resultant force being AC. You can use your head to tail method where you take your first force being AB, which is represented here, drawn out here, and BC, which is here, which represents BC. So you would take your first vector, connect your second vector's tail to the head of the first vector as shown here, and then you would draw your resultant from the tail of the first vector to the head of the last vector which would then give you your resultant vector. Um, some points to remember. If the question says graphically, it means you must use a scale diagram, which means you must use a scale, a chosen scale. You can choose any scale to represent each Newton of force and then draw your vector according to that. And of course, use your angles and your bearing to determine which way your forces are going to be drawn. All vectors must have an arrow head. Label each vector's magnitude and direction. Bearing is always measured clockwise from north and vectors must always be drawn head to tail. If you look at resultant vectors uh, at right angles, it is a lot easier because you don't necessarily have to draw it out. You can simply, so A would be your first vector, B would be a second vector, and you can use uh, trigonometric ratios and Pythagoras to solve for your resultant vector as well as the angle. You must always include this angle when giving your resultant vector. Then another thing that becomes very important in physics, in many of the sections of the physics syllabus, is resolving a vector into its components. So a single vector can be split in, into a number of components, X and Y components being your horizontal component, your X component, and your Y component being your vertical. So say, as shown in this example, um, a wind blows on a bearing of 240 degrees. So here's your wind, this would be your wind at 20 meters per second. So we've got, we've labeled our, our vector, 240 degrees, we now would like to solve for the X component and the Y component. So we know that this is 90 degrees because we know X and Y form a 90 degree. If you, we know that this is, this is 90 degrees here. And we know that this minus, well, this angle here minus this angle here will be 240 minus 90, which is 150. Then we know that 180 minus 150 is 30. So we know that theta is 30 degrees. We can then use that in our trigonometric ratios to solve for Y as shown over here. And we can use that to solve for X as shown here. 
or in this case we've used Pythagoras, but you could have used any trigonometric ratio and you solve it into your X and Y components, which becomes very useful um, as you get more and more vectors, then you can calculate your resultant using your components. So as shown here, calculate the tension in a rope supporting a walker, which is 750 newtons. Rope makes an angle of 20 degrees. So we know there's 750 newtons complete acting down. Now we need to calculate each Y component of these two tensions. So we would solve for Y as shown over here. And we would come out at your Y being... Uh, so you solve for Y including your T for tension, two of them are the, the two tensions are the same. So you would do a simultaneous and you would come out with your tension being 1096 newtons for each rope. Then we look at equilibrium, which becomes important um, when we are given a object in equilibrium. The sum of your vectors up equals your sum of your vectors down and the sum of the vectors left equal the sum of the vectors right. This happens when an object is at rest or moving at a constant velocity, i.e. there's no acceleration or there's constant acceleration. So calculating a resultant force with components. So as shown here, you have a number of forces acting on an object. You resolve each force. So here's a six Newton, here's the eight Newton um, force. And we know that the five Newton only acts down. So there's no need to calculate the components because you only have a Y component and no X component. So you solve it into your components and we've got a Y and an X for the six Newton and an X and a Y for the eight Newton. We then add all the X's together as shown here. Sorry, we, we add the 7.25 because that is acting left and we minus the the 4.6 because that is acting right. If they op if they act in opposite directions, you take the bigger one minus the smaller one to get your resultant. And if they act in the same direction, you simply add them. For the Y, you do the same thing. You add these two because they are in the same direction. They are both going up. And then you minus five because five is going down. Then you get your resultants. You can draw out your resultants as shown here using 2.24 up shown here. 2.65 left shown here. So left and up head to tail method. Solve for using Pythagoras. You know, this is 90 degrees. You can solve for your resultants and then use all of your, your vector magnitudes here to use a trigonometric ratio and solve for your theta, which you give in the answer as your direction of your resultant vector. Then we move on to something which is very important. It's the inclined plane. Often you'll be given an object which sits on a plane, which is inclined, and you're often asked to calculate the friction or the horizontal gravity component or the perpendicular gravity component. It's easiest to solve it um, in this way. You can draw out a triangle where the bottom section of the triangle is your force of your FG parallel. So it's the force acting down the slope, the gravitational force acting down the slope. This component will be your normal. So it's the force acting on the object from the surface. And FG is simply your weight acting straight down, where FF is your force of friction holding the object on the plane. So in this example, you have a three kg object rests on a 30 degree slope, calculate the force of friction. So we know that the force of friction is going to equal our force of gravity because, sorry, the force of gravity parallel because your object is at rest and therefore in equilibrium. So we know our FG, sorry, our force up the hill and the force down the hill are equal. So using this triangle, we know that FG is 29.4, simply about times in your three by 9.8 to get your weight. We know that this is 30 degrees because you, this angle is equal to this angle of the slope shown here. And by doing that, we solve for FG parallel using a trigonometric ratio and it comes out at 14.7 Newtons. So we then know that the frictional force is 14.7 because it is equal to the force down the slope. 
And there'll be many examples where you have to use this theory, um, especially in matric. There are a number of questions which are often asked where you will need this theory to answer them. So here's a, a bit more of a complicated one. Um, not in the sense that the question is complicated, it's the same question, but it's just drawn out more in depth to show you how we do it. So this triangle is what you will use mostly to solve. This is your weight, which is simply the, the mass of the object times 9.8. This is your angle. Your angle of this triangle equals the angle of inclination of the slope. So this angle here will always be equal to this angle in your solving triangle. This angle over here is always 90 degrees. You can take that as a given, so you can use your trigonometric ratios. And this FG parallel component over here is always equal to your frictional force. So often when you have to calculate your friction, you will use this FG parallel because you know that it is always equal. Yeah, so this just outlines how you would draw the triangle. So draw your straight line down for your weight. Draw a line perpendicular to the surface, which would be here connect the triangle and this is 90 degrees same angle as your angle of inclination and fg parallel is always equal to friction then we have the parallelogram law which is not often tested but can come in handy in some circumstances where you can use it but it's not essential so say here you had two two forces acting from the same point over here but acting in different directions so these two are acting from here this one acts up and down you can then draw a parallelogram as drawn here where you, this force over here would be replicated over here and this force would be replicated over here with the same magnitude and the same direction where your co-interior angles equal 180 degrees and you connect the point where they act to the point of the heads of the second vectors and that would be a resultant vector with your angle of direction of the vector. So this can be useful in some instances, however you can always use your components of vectors to answer the question instead of this parallelogram law, it may just be easier in some circumstances to use the parallelogram law.